Um, hi, it's lovely to see you all. Um, Doug's already said I'm Miles Berry. I work at the University of Roehampton. I've been doing this for two and a half years now and have a whale of a time. Um, that's the wrong slide. <laughs> okay, this is what happens when you do these in entirely the wrong order. Or we'll skip one. Sorry. Prezi's great. Is anybody feeling seasick already? <laughs> that will do. This is the University of Roehampton, or at least this is part of it. That's where the Vice Chancellor's office is. I have a sort of office made out of breeze blocks a little distance away from this. Um, before that, I was a primary school head teacher for three years, um, hence all the grey hair. Um, this meant, though, that during assemblies, nobody was allowed to say, Miles, you've gone on too long. Stop, please, stop. And they had to sort of be well behaved and listen. So I'm not expecting you to be well behaved and listen, but Doug, you need to tell me when to stop. So I sort of I wave I point things. Out, I have a number right. Of things to stop <laughs> okay. Froebel College, which is Roehampton, like Oxford, Cambridge, and one or two others, is a collegiate university. Um, I'm at Froebel College, which is named after Friedrich Froebel, who invented the kindergarten. Mitch Resnick, the man behind Scratch, says the kindergarten is the greatest invention ever. You know, more important than the book, more important than the internet. Yeah? He might not be entirely right there. The kindergarten certainly is an important thing. Here's an old German painting of what a kindergarten looked like. And, you know, that different to the way we do things these days? <coughs> not entirely certain it would pass its early years inspection. You know, the, the adults there are not paying particularly close attention. But learning is happening. You know, the children have a lovely, rich, vibrant environment. They're working with one another. They're talking to one another. Okay, there's purposeful activities, certainly, and learning is taking place, I'd say. The other thing Froebel is known for is coming up with these things called the Froebel gifts, one of which is building blocks. You give these to a child and talk to them about them, and they often start building things. You're all, uh, sure, sort of familiar with Lego and things like that. Froebel, Froebel gifts, Froebel blocks predate that. One of the people who went to a Froebel kindergarten in America was Frank Lloyd Wright, um, who became a great architect. I think we see, you know, points in common <laughs> there, yeah? <laughs> the, the stuff which we're doing in early years, the stuff which we're doing at school, can have a huge impact on what our children go on to do in later life. And, you know, building things matters. The word pedagogy has possibly put people <coughs> off this presentation, but clearly not you. Um, there are misconceptions about what a pedagogue is, or at least was, that if you look at the etymology of it from the OED here, it wasn't the teacher. It was the household slave who took the child to the place where the learning happened. And I think that's a powerful metaphor to keep returning to. You know, we're not necessarily the ones conveying a body of knowledge, the greatest things of a previous culture. We are the ones who take the child to the place where they can learn. Um, Ofsted, in the report which David was talking about a few moments ago, talk about pedagogy. They also say that in ICT, the pedagogy to them appears worse than it appears when ICT is being used in other subjects, which is slightly worrying. That, you know, they were seeing better pedagogical skills and understanding of teachers in other subjects compared to what they were seeing in ICT, where it focused, come on in, please, come on in, you know, where it focused so much on getting children through tests, essentially. Um, this is a speech from the Secretary of State at <laughs> BET. The, 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 the statement there is not meant as a metaphor, really, it isn't. You know? um, but what we have is, is the text instead of the YouTube video of that, I'm afraid. Fundamental model of school education, a teacher talking to a group of pupils, barely changed over the centuries, ever since Plato established the academia in a shady olive grove in ancient Athens. His classical roots are showing, aren't they? A Victorian school teacher entering a 21st century classroom, feeling completely at home. Whiteboards, chairs in groups, but still a teacher standing at the front, talking, testing, questioning. That model won't be the same in 20 years' time. It may well be extinct in 10. That's a radical thought, isn't that? Well, from an interesting source, I would suggest. <laughs> um, moving on. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Actions speak louder than words very often to <laughs> discuss. Um, anybody do all three of the, 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 the faces on the screen there? Apart from Doug, who's had to sit through this already. <laughs> anybody do two out of the three? Oh, your PGC tutors would be so disappointed. Go on. No, but thank you for playing. No, my verb. They're good answers. Both are, you know, cool people to ask. At least, you know... Right. We have here B.F. Skinner, 
We have here Jean Piaget and we have Lev Vygotsky. Do those PGC lectures seem to be coming flooding back to you now? Is this the first time in the last intervening years that you've heard these names mentioned? Okay, I'm sorry about that. But, absolutely doesn't it, though. <laughs> Fair point. Okay. So V.F. Skinner, and we have this notion of behaviorism of, of, you know, you can use this to train pigeons, you can use this to train dogs, you can use, use this to train children to do multiplication questions at the very least. If you get these questions right, I will give you a biscuit. You see this in so much ICT used in education when it comes to these sort of behaviorist games. I'm going to ask you 10 multiplication questions. If you get them right, I'll ask you 10 slightly harder multiplication questions. If you get them wrong, I'll either ask you the same 10 questions or slightly easier ones. There's adaptive learning design for you. Jean Piaget says you learn or we learn through constructing our understanding of the world, through exploring an environment, through discovery, through play, through experiment. Lev Vygotsky goes on to say or said that actually it's through discussion, it's through conversation, it's through talking to other people. And I think these two approaches are ones which apply particularly when it comes to learning stuff on a computer. Well, they do apply to learning stuff with computers, to learning stuff on a computer, but not just to those things. Another error has occurred. Please try again later. This is a lovely thing from Skinner in the 1960s of him doing these, these, electri these mechanical teaching machines where it just asks questions and you write in the answer and then the machine says whether it's right or wrong. It looks so much like some of the stuff which we're doing online these days. I showed this slide right at the start of our BA and PGC courses, and I say, when it comes to ICT, I think, and I have no evidence to support this view, that there are these three learning styles that apply. We have folk who like to learn through play, through discovery, through experiment, the Piagetian stuff. We have folk who like to read the manual or the instructions. Do you remember when computer manuals were printed, anybody in the room? Okay, one or two. Okay. <laughs> or through watching the YouTube walkthroughs or whatever. Well, we have folk who like to have somebody sat alongside helping, supporting, guiding. And of course, you're going to choose the one which depends on the situation. But I think many of us have a propensity to one rather than the other. And I'd like you to sort of own up to what your chosen learning style when it comes to ICT stuff is. When you learn something new on a computer, could you put your hand up, please, if you like to do that through play, through experiment, through discovery, through exploration? OK, this is a very similar proportion to what I got in the last group. I think this is a self-selecting sample to a large extent. OK, what about the folk who like to have the manual, please, or the walkthroughs? Nobody. The help files? OK, one. <laughs> That's fine. It's OK. It's perfectly valid. It's not wrong. <laughs> um, who like to have somebody alongside helping? Yeah, you find tech support helpful when you phone them up? Okay, yeah, people as well. <laughs> Tech support sometimes are people too, but not always. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it isn't that interesting, though, that this is how we've all learned so much of what we've learned. I think this is how many, many children learn their stuff with technology. And yet, so much of the time, we treat IT lessons in this style of, I'm going to stand up at the board and show you how to use this bit of software, okay, now could you all go on and practice this, yeah? Or... Probably worse still. Here is a worksheet. Oh, well done. You've done that very well. Here is the extension worksheet, you lucky <laughs> child. Yeah? <laughs> no. That's not how we've learned our stuff. That's not how they're learning their techie stuff at home when it comes to their phones and their Facebook things and all of that. And so why assume that this works well when it comes to teaching this in school? Well, it's just because that's how we do school, I fear. Um, I asked my PGCE students to write me a blog post about how they learn to use, or how they've learned to use technology, or like to learn technology. Okay, you're racing ahead of me there. <laughs> okay. Which bit did you laugh at? Extracting many of the beliefs. <laughs> yes. Teaching people things they already know, it's not a sensible use of our time. It really isn't. If you know this already, please feel free to go to another seminar. <laughs> Doug, not you. <laughs> Apologies for the spellings. Trial and error. It comes back so often in these blog posts. Slightly more scaffolded. And the use of Google to solve problems. You do this, don't you? If you get stuck, you Google. I love that bit at the end. You can't break this stuff. I assume she's an Apple user. 
Okay, um, we asked them to, to do the same exercises I just made you do, um, to pick one of the three, and of course the clever students say, Mars, it depends, but we get, you know, 42% of them, I expected it to be more, going for that sort of first option, I like to figure things out for myself, I really do. And others who would very much like me to provide worksheets and help files and manuals, tough, um, but we do do the support, the one-to-one -one support. We also do the skills audit, which... Um, Peter showed yes, an earlier version of this yesterday. This is just undergraduate students. This year we asked, oops. This year we asked them to grade themselves on a five point competency scale of can they use a projector without disconnecting it? I'm hoping that this is going to come back live. <laughs> Computer one, RGB. Computer says. Uh, it's not looking good, folks. I'm ever so sorry. Um, I think I'm nearly there. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the offer, though. That was really kind of you. Really appreciate that. So the stuff down the bottom of the graph here, they are pretty good at. They've picked up this themselves, or they've listened well when it's been taught to them in lessons. So, you know, the stuff which you'd expect, you can use social software. Most of them seem to think they're pretty good when it comes to Facebook. 28% of them regard themselves as expert. They can still use email. They can use a web browser, blah, 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 yeah? Stuff above the sort of halfway point here, we move into diminishing proportions. So working with <coughs> digital audio, we drop to 35% proficient or better. Um, using spreadsheets, many of them have GCSE, ICT. They should have all done spreadsheets as part of that, but they hated it. By and large, you know, spreadsheets about sweet shops, not their idea of fun. So they sort of tried to blank it out from their recollection and drop to 20% proficient or expert when it comes to that. Um, interactive whiteboards, <laughs> given their sort of chosen career, 25% with no knowledge, expertise, skills, 6% proficient or expert. These are children, sorry, these are students. Old habits die hard. <laughs> okay. These are students who've been in school. And, you know, before they came to us, in many, many cases, they've had interactive whiteboards in the classrooms they've been working in, but have never got to play with the thing. You know, making a presentation, they immediately think PowerPoint. Why not use Smart Notebook or Active Inspire or whatever as the medium for those presentations? So that's obviously something which we address. And then, of course, the, the one which won't come as a shock, programming, creating macros, simple scripting, 65% of them, no knowledge of that at all when it comes to you know, their self-assessment on these things. These, many of these students have been in school for the previous 14 years since all of that time creating sequences and instructions programming has been on the national curriculum. <laughs> how can they say? How can two-thirds of them say? We don't know how to do any of that. You know, a little bit of knowledge ought to have been part of what they were taught. This year, we're also asking them about their knowledge and understanding, and we have a very different picture with this. <laughs> Look, the skills is actually all right. We have two-thirds of them, competent, proficient, expert across that portfolio of skills. Understanding, look at this, only a, less than a quarter of them regard themselves as at least competent when it comes to an understanding of ICT, technology. Over a third of them saying they're ticking the box to say they have no understanding of how computers work. Isn't that dread? Do you not think something should be done? No? How can we focus so much on delivering skills and not on providing an understanding of how this stuff works, gets made, <coughs> etc.? Um, you know, so again, this is something I should try to address. So you look at this by learning style, and that's interesting too, I think, that those who like to have the support there nearly 15% competent or better when it comes to understanding. Those who are willing to figure it out for themselves to explore, to experiment, almost a third of them are in that box of competent, proficient, or expert when it comes to that. Now, I'm not sure which direction causality goes here. Is it that those who are willing to play get a better understanding? Or is it those who, with the understanding, are more willing to play? Which way do you think? Hands up for... Understanding brings, leads, lets you play. Hands up for play brings about understanding. 
Whoa. Okay, that's really impressive. I want to get into the, the detail of this and talk to students about their stories in this. The, the survey results doesn't sort of reveal enough of this. How are we doing for time, Doug? You have another 15 minutes. All right, okay. Um, have a go at this. You know, talk to a friend briefly, quickly. Now, three qualities which you'd want your learners, the people you're working with, I don't know, some of you school teachers who, is, who here is still a teacher in an actual classroom with real life pupils. Brilliant. Okay, the rest of you are working with people who I'm sure are still learning things, yeah? So the three qualities you'd like your learners to have when they move on. Just one minute. Talk to a friend. Quickly. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Right, if we had a proper interactive whiteboard thingy, I'd put some words up on the screen. Um, who's got a good one? Who's got one? <laughs> Qualities you want people to have? Resilience. Resilience, love it. Anything else? Independence. Independence, very good. Curiosity. Oh, I like that. You said that? that Curiosity, that's very nice. <coughs> Adaptability. 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 That's going to be important, isn't it? Enthusiasm. Sorry? Enthusiasm. Oh, yes. How do you teach for enthusiasm? <laughs> Virtue. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, yeah, but if you put, if you put clip art on it, that would be much more enthusiastic. <laughs> Shall I do a little bit of work on clip art? No. Okay. Um, any, any other good answers? Well, we have a sort of cycle really, which Ooh. was curiosity, confidence, resilience. Mm -hmm. Oh, I say. Exceeded expectations. Risk of being lynched. Um, knowledge. Knowledge is not necessarily bad. You know, you know, I, 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 knowledge and understanding are a big fan of knowledge. Things which we don't deal with nearly enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I said to my students, what's the difference between the web and the internet? Mm -hmm. Same thing. <laughs> Who invented the web? <laughs> it's always been that. <laughs> well, for some of them it has. <laughs> Collaborative skills. Yes. They can be working with other people at some stage. None of you in your conversation said getting an A start to C. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, you're not all working with people who are repetitive or A start to C. But the point of the exercise is if this is what you want them to move on from you like, that's got to affect the way you teach them. If you want A start to C passes, fine. By all means, do that. And that will affect the way you teach. If you want independence, did somebody say independence? I heard independence around the room. Yeah. If you want adaptability, if you want curiosity, if you want curiosity, how, you don't teach for curiosity by saying, our learning objective today is, <laughs> I'm going to tell you all about this. You know, that is going to be kind of counterproductive if you want curious children in more than one sentence. Um, <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so, you know, at the risk of contradicting yourself here, we start with our requirements and then we design a curriculum based on that. And this is what, you know, education systems have kind of done. This is Waterfall Software Development does this too. And, you know, big, you know, national, you know, public infrastructure IT systems usually run out of money before they get to the third stage in this. But, you know, other systems do actually get that far. So th this is tried and tested. This is largely how we teach software development when it comes to GCSE and A-level ICT. Other methods apply, like an iterative development process. And perhaps when it comes to curriculum design, 
We ought to be less concerned with a waterfall approach and more concerned with an iterative cycle of lesson planning and curriculum design and actually just seeing how these lessons go. And of course, this is something we try to get RRU students to do on pretty much a daily or hourly basis of using the evaluation to inform the future planning and putting a cycle there. And I think we've got this message now, haven't we? we, we okay, big picture stuff is still quite waterfall-y. But actually, when it comes to our lessons, we've moved more to an iterative development model. There's better stuff still, though. You know, if you look at how software gets written, a lot of the really cool stuff these days is happening using these agile methods. And saying, okay, this stuff is fine. But actually, there's much better, faster, more interesting, more fun ways of doing this, of responding to the change, of not seeing the customer as somebody who signs off the specifications and then gets the software, you know, in a year or... 10 years later, it's actually working with the customer and getting something that works and tweaking that and making it better and improving it as we go along. And let's start thinking about curriculum design and lesson planning and all of that stuff in a more agile sort of way of listening to our students, We're using them as, as co-producers of this stuff and being less con concerned about processes and tools and more concerned about working with individuals and the interaction with the people we're teaching in our classrooms, or wherever. Doug, how am I doing? You've got about five minutes. Uh, five, okay. okay, five minutes to do about 30 slides. <laughs> Here we go. Seymour Papert, everybody recognize the man with the beard? Seymour Papert, logo. So Piaget, Papert was one of Piaget's students, whereas Piaget says you learn through discovery, through exploration, through play, through interacting with your environment. Vygotsky says you do this through talk. Happens in the is you actually, when it comes to computing stuff particularly, he said, you learn this through building stuff, through making things for other people to see. I don't think it is just ICT. Think about art. Think about, you know, pretty much anything, really. The, the making something. You know, a student's writing their essays. They learn through that process of making things for at least one other person to see. Constructionism is the term he used for this, um, which I uh, don't have time for you to read. So more logo pictures. You know, we've done this for 40-odd years now. Have a look at some of the really early stuff coming from Papert back in the 1970s. It's still just as valid today as it was then. So yeah, pedagogy for the third millennium was pretty much invented back in the 70s. We do this with our students. You know, the first time they use Smart Notebook, we don't teach them it. We just say, here is a tool. Figure it out for yourself. Here is a task. I want you to make a Smart Notebook slide about how you could use ICT to support <coughs> learning in a particular subject of your choice. And that's it. They hate it. They really do. They think, you know, an ICT lecture, there ought to be somebody telling us how to use the software. That's what happened at school. You know? So the, the, it's a real sort of baptism of fire process. But this is the sort of thing we get from them 30, 40 minutes later. If they've just, you know, had a go and explored and discovered. Okay, this is not difficult software to use. This is a little bit harder. This is dear old Scratch, which John David describes as struggleware. Struggle is good, though. You know, the, those of you who put resilience or perseverance on your list of three qualities, you don't want stuff which is as easy as Smart Notebook where everybody will succeed. You want something where there's a little bit of challenge and bite to it. And so we get them coding up little games. We say game, and they immediately think, oh, educational game. What is four times four? Why have they not listened to me when I've been talking about Skinner and saying, you know, there's better ways of doing it than this? Never mind. They've actually constructed something. They've made something, which in some way embodies at least part of their understanding of how at least a bit of education kind of can work. Um, Mitch Resnick, the man behind Scratch, great advert of kindergarten. His group at MIT is called the Lifelong Kindergarten Group and talks about this kindergarten approach to learning with those of you who said it's all a circle, it's all a cycle there, you know, there's an element of the iterative development to this, <coughs> isn't there, of, of moving from and then back. Brensky talks a lot about digital natives. Footnote here to the lecture, you know, largely discredited now, not a helpful term, blah, 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 um, says that this is how your digital natives, our digital natives learn. As I say, I have students who are younger than the web now. They are, if we mean anything by digital natives, digital natives. And Prensky says, this is the sort of way they like to learn. Um, is this rocket science? You know, could we not come up with this list ourselves without charging quite so much for a day's training as Prensky probably does? <laughs> is there anything on there that surprises you? Do you think, no, 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 my students wouldn't be like that? 
I mean, the only thing that, I mean, I don't disagree with you, but I mean, a lot of students like to be fed. Yeah. And, and so if you do... Because that's what we do, do in school. You do, because what we do in school. Yeah. So you let them loose, and they say... What I don't do know we, what to do. What do, do Is now? this on the exam, sir? <laughs> well, <what is> <laughs> hmm. well, how do you deal with that? Um, hopefully they get there. Okay. Right. Hmm. Only to cooperate and compete. Okay. Yes. This doesn't go down well when I show the slide, slide at Roehampton, you know, trying to teach a training college, compete, oh dear, no. But yeah, I mean, they are hugely competitive. You know, if you put them on the red table or the blue table, they will know which is group one and which is group two fairly quickly on. You know, we, we obviously don't want them to feel that they're competing with one another. Competing with themselves, I think we all feel a little more comfortable about. But, you know, you look at some of the gamification stuff, it is a very competitive thing, and... Hmm, I have students who argue the case fairly vociferously that the world is a competitive place, Miles, and we need to kind of recognise this. It doesn't go down well with my programme boards, but never mind. <laughs> but yes, compete is an interesting one to pick up on. Just, just on that point, of being completely um, about five years ago, we equipped every child with a device. And, um, that sounds really painful. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Under medical supervision, of course. So, <laughs> no, but the, the concern was, and what's the parents doing? If they've got their own uh, device, they're just going to be like drones. Yeah. Like <laughs> so, well, we don't think we will, but you know, we will see. And the, the cooperate and compete, we, we saw every single day. Oh, if wow. You to buy, one child would find something or develop something, yeah. and everybody would want it. So yeah. So, cooperation then. But competition, what you found was <laughs> the group, the cohort, yeah. they all increased because as soon as one child won, found a different need yeah. or, or something that nobody else had. They all then wanted it, so it was competing with yeah. constantly. And the teacher often just sitting to one side going, I don't know what to do. Now. <laughs> <laughs> that so that's better than just doing their eBay worse. shopping, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> the teacher would lose that's absolutely brilliant. And you know, you have so much so many of us for our education, the only people who wrote the things that we so the only people who read things that we wrote were our teachers or occasionally our parents if we came from nice middle class homes but nowadays you can put this stuff on the blog or on the wiki and have a genuine audience for the content and what we're seeing at Roehampton is this really ups the game once they start to see what one another are writing then okay a little bit of healthy competition here of I don't want mine to be obviously the least effort that's gone into a piece of work on this particular task there's no bad, no, no, controversial view, but no bad thing. Nobody's thrown anything at me. It's all well, right. That's okay. Your, that's, mm. your, that's your personal specification for a teacher or for somebody wanting. Oh! Yeah. Recruit like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the government's saying all this stuff about, you know, we've got to look at the way we recruit people into teaching. That's it. Yeah. How are they going to do these things by us modelling it, perhaps? Oh, no, they'll do this anyhow. But if we model it, if we actually teach like this rather than just recognising that they, this is how they learn. And of course, the students that I'm working with, many of them are digital natives. This is their preferred approach to learning. In three years' time, they're going to be out there teaching yeah, but they're going to as this sort school, of person. Say, oh, forget all that because you just got to get these to see yeah. Them. I hope they've had sufficiently subversive lecturers at university to think, it doesn't matter what senior management say, I'm just going to go off and do my... <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm recording this! <laughs> can, can I just say, it's not a personal specification for someone who's going to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games, are they? Because you don't need any of those things to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. You need a lot well, of other things, but they are not part They of want them. to compete with each other, probably does That's help. That's the only one. Okay. In this, I can't see that there's any problem with well, they want to follow their own interests and passions, probably. Yeah, okay. Right, okay. If you want to go now, please do. Right. Um, what we have there is, um, Prensky says, you've got to move, if this is, Prensky's argument is, this is what learners are like, let's do the things that we're good at and let them do the things that they're good at. Partnering pedagogy is the way he christens it. So you let your learners do this sort of thing and we take a role in doing the stuff which they haven't learned to do yet or don't have a natural propensity to do. So we ask the right questions. We give the students guidance. We do sort of 
think about the broader context for this stuff. And, you know, the cultural literacy stuff applies at that sort of point. It really does. And rigor matters, quality matters. Sending children back because they've not done it properly isn't a bad thing. You see this with Wikipedia stuff. This is simple Wikipedia. Everybody knows simple Wikipedia? Okay. You... you n.wikipedia.org is really complicated language, really, really long articles. Simple.wikipedia.org is written for people who are learning English, which applies to most of the children's students that you'll be working with. And so it's a really nice alternative. And it's still not finished. You know, whereas contributing to changing Wikipedia is hard work. Simple Wikipedia is much easier. KWL approach, start with what you know. What is it you want to learn? Do this sort of creative curriculum stuff. We're allowed by the Secretary of State, assuming everything goes through on the of September, to start doing this in ICT lessons. <laughs> Rather than, here is the ring binder. It is, what do you want to learn today? What do you know about this already? How are you going to figure this out? You can do that from September if you want to. If your head teacher lets you. Game-based learning, they say all of these lovely, lovely things about it that you, when, you're learning, when you're playing a video game, you're goal-orientated, you've got this immediate interactivity, you've got a very, very tight feedback loop, you know how well you're doing, there's a strong sense of progression from one level on to the next. There are problems, there are challenges, it is hard stuff. And you have a extremely high sense of flow there, where you're so absorbed in what you're doing, much like being at a next conference, where you would imagine most of you. So the argument is, which of these things would you not like to see a little more of in your classroom? Any? Fine. So if computer games do this, and we want this sort of thing in our classroom, let's do our lessons a little more like the way computer games work. And James Paul Gee writes a very good book about, you know, the 31 ways that people learn video games, and let's apply those to literacy. My students have recorded some brilliant videos on this. Oops, that's not going to move on. And Jay McGonigal applies the same thing to whole kinds, all kinds of real-world problems. And you're seeing this also with learning to program. Everybody know Code Academy? Okay, who? It's worth looking at. Codecademy dot com.org, Google, Code Academy, or Bing, other search engines are available. Um, and you've got this sort of levels and badges, and there's this immediate feedback as to how well <coughs> it's going. Quite behaviorist in some ways. But on the other hand, great fun. Downs and Siemens say the learning theory for the digital age is about connectivism, that it's no longer important so much what you know as what you can find out. If you know, they, I imagine everybody in the room could tell me the date of the Battle of Bosworth if I gave them three minutes and access to the internet, yeah? And you've probably got a device which provides access to the internet with you, yeah? Okay, it's not probably a very important question, but that does kind of change things, you know? Being able to find out the answer to pretty much any question, being able to teach yourself almost anything through being literate, having digital connectivity, being sufficiently motivated is potentially a game changer. Okay, dentistry is probably something where I would want somebody to have done a training course, but most other things. Um, learning is about making connections between neurons, between ideas, and between people, and the personal learning network matters. You know, NACE conference is a lovely example. Twitter is a great example of that, too. Um, learning, according to Etchen Wenger, is all about, you know, there are four processes here that are involved. We have this stuff, we have this stuff which teach training degrees, which um, most schools do pretty well, but there's also learning as becoming part of the community, learning as becoming a different sort of person, and it's important to recognize those aspects to it too. Um, this is our blog platform, blah, 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 blah. You're seeing this with people who are trained to be software developers are thinking about the process of apprenticeship, and they have this sort of pattern language. This is Hoover and Oshinai. Um, who come up with this lovely sort of set of metaphors, set of common patterns to the way people learn to be software developers. And the same thing applies in other disciplines too. The first sort of pattern language stuff was done about architecture, of reusing similar ideas and to solve similar problems. And you have it with object-oriented programming. And some folk have gone and done it for teaching too. So these are the reusable patterns when it comes to how you teach people things. Um, and there's nine bullet points with which to leave you. <laughs> okay. Thank Sorry. you very much. <laughs>